Okay. Hello, um, welcome to this, the fourth um, of four um, MR in uh, radiotherapy webinars that IPEM have been hosting over the last month. Um, I'm Jim Daniel, um, I'm the Head of Treatment Planning and Brachytherapy at uh, the James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough, and I have a seat on the Radiotherapy Special Interest Group, um, and I'm chairing the session for today. Um, firstly, I just need to make you all aware that uh, the session is being recorded, um, so anything that you contribute to the session will be also recorded. Um, can you please stay on mute um, throughout all of the session um, until we get to the end where if you want to ask a question, um, you'll be asked to unmute and um, ask your question that way. Um, do keep your questions for the end in that sense, but anything that you think of during the session can be added into the chat window. Um, so please do that um, as we go through. Um, so yeah, just to lead into the session, um, the first webinar was about governance for MRI. And the second one was about protocols and patient setup. Um, and then finally, last week, we had one um, on MRI from an international perspective. And today we are looking at um, the um, uh, MRI uh, uh, quality assurance and quality control uh, in, in MRI for radiotherapy planning. Um, can I just check uh, that people can see the slides, can see the presentation? We got a nod or a thumbs up from anyone. <laughs> Maria, can you see? Yeah, good stuff. Okay, well, um, what I'll do then is I will pass on the control to Maria, um, who will kick us off. Maria, you're on mute. Okay, can you see my mouse, please? In the center of the screen, okay. I seem to be unable to move the slides on. Uh, try again, I think it's working. There you go. Yes. yes, okay. So the first thing I wanted to do was to highlight our publication, the IPM topical report, that is a, a guidance paper. Just about everything that we will be talking about today is in this report and all the tables that are presented are in the report. The report refers to other IPM documents, and occasionally I'll make some reference to the AAPM uh, report, which is a document of similar scope that is in broad agreement with ours. The discussion here is restricted to workflows based on CTMR fusion, where we combine the electron density from CT to the soft tissue contrast of the MRI. This is how most institutions get introduced into radiotherapy and is a most common workflow. This is just an example here. In this context, there will be many tasks undertaken by different people at different times leading to the radiotherapy planning. The, the role of MRI in this context is to allow better outlining of tumor volume and organs at risk using the best soft tissue contrast that we can offer. MRI will be used to assess motion and thus to contribute to margin determination and to identify biological target volumes in some cases, perhaps using uh, functional imaging. So, sorry. This section is roughly divided in three parts. We are gonna start looking at the auxiliary equipment with Stephen and this is mostly for the benefit of MRI personnel because we are less familiar with that. Then I'm gonna talk about the MRI examination in itself and the additional needs for geometric accuracy. And finally, uh, Ben is gonna talk about the CTMR registration. This is also mostly for the benefit of MRI personnel because we tend to lose sight of what happens to our images 
after they leave the MR unit. And it's quite important that we see the entire process. So at this point, I would like to hand it over to Stephen. Uh, sorry, uh, quite difficult to control this stuff. And I, I do realise that I made a rather poor job of um, hosting at the start there. Maria, did you, did you actually introduce yourself? I didn't introduce you. Uh, okay, I'm Maria Schmidt. I'm a clinical scientist. Uh, I have retired recently and I used to work for the Royal Marsden. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Steve, maybe you could introduce yourself as you as you begin your talk, and I'm trying to give you control. I think you've got control. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name's Steve Headley, and I'm lead clinical scientist up in Newcastle. Um, and yeah, so as Maria said, thank you, Maria, for introducing us there. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the auxiliary equipment that we have on an MR scanner. Again, mainly focused at those in the audience who are more from an MR background as opposed to radiotherapy. Um, let me try to advance the slide. There we go. So very briefly, just a bit of a recap about why we have these um, pieces of equipment, the rationale within the radiotherapy uh, patient pathway. Um, then looking at the guidance, um, particularly looking at the, the aspects of IPEM 81 that it draws from and practical tips for commissioning. So, um, you may or may not be familiar in terms of the radiotherapy pathway. Patients will typically have um, come in for a scan, a CT scan, and then anywhere from one to two weeks later, they will then come back into the department to have uh, their treatment delivered, and the treatment will be delivered over a, a number of consecutive days. And so we have these various time points within the patient's um, treatment. And what we're ultimately aiming to do is deliver a high uh, high dose of conformal uh, conformal dose of radiotherapy to the uh, particular target volume whilst minimizing dose that we're delivering to surrounding normal tissue. And obviously we, we're using this based on a snapshot in time based on a CT scan. Um, and because we've got these various time points, the um, treatment um, fractionations, delivery that we have, then we want to have consistency throughout this entire process. Consistency being kind of the key word here. So practically what this means for our um, imaging and treatment delivery equipment is we have these ancillary equipments, so the flat couch tops and external laser systems, which allow us to give um, consistent patient positioning. So examples here on the left of the CT scan with its flat couch top, we have these indexing positions to allow us to um, place uh, immobilization device devices for our patients. And they can then be transferred onto our treatment machines, which have the same types of uh, couch tops with indexing as well. And then also external laser systems to allow us kind of to translate from one machine's coordinate system to another. So if we have an MR scan um, involved, then we want to have the same ancillary equipment. So typically you will have a flat couch top either from a third party or the, um, the manufacturer of the scanner themselves might provide their own solution. So we can replicate these um, processes, but obviously we need to check that everything's okay. So this would be the kind of things we do during commissioning, acceptance, and then periodically with our QA program. So very coarse example here, if we have our scanner, which has a, um, a couch top, which is not level, but we've got la level lasers, we'll be placing marks, uh, reference marks on our patients at this point, which will then be used subsequently for their treatment. And if we have these reference marks in the wrong position because of either the, the couch is not level or our lasers are not coincident, or something like that, then it means when we come to deliver our treatment, it's gonna be very different, very difficult to have a consistent positioning of our patient. Patient might be uncomfortable and therefore can affect the quality of the treatment that we deliver. So that's basically why we want these systems and why we want them to be nice and level. So the recommendations within the topical report um, follow uh, sections within uh, another IPEM report, IPEM 81, which has aspects uh, focused on CT within radiotherapy pathway. Um, but the report kind of reflects the fact that MR couches and MR, the overlays are not they're fundamentally different to a CT couch. The couch top is not uh, cantilevered and it's not gonna be moving during the acquisition in the same way that a CT scan would. Um, so the recommendations are 
very simple um, in terms of where there's two lots of laser laser tests. So a basic set, which are done on a, on a daily uh, basis for our QC, and then a full external laser check, which is done monthly. And then the couch is checked on an annual basis in terms of uh, deflection and how flat it is with and without load. Equipment that you need is fairly basic. Um, so when we're checking laser couch, uh, sorry, laser level or couch level, um, you can use something like a spirit level and a ruler. Um, just important to remember that they are MR safe or MR conditional. So aluminium spirit level, for example, and a, um, and a plastic ruler. And then when it comes to um, measuring, uh, measuring these when we've got load on the couch, Practically, this can be quite difficult. The bores of the laser, uh, the bores of the MR scanner are typically smaller than a CT scanner, but it's using something like plastic water butts, um, or you might be able to squeeze a physicist in there, um, provided they've been screened and everything. But you, you can have a, 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 a per person on the couch, um, but practically, you've got to take some steps to kind of figure out logically how you can actually measure. Uh, certain things. You can also place markers like cod liver oil tablets on top of your flat couch top overlay and then look at uh, level within your resulting images as well. Um, other routes to doing this can be achieved through things like self-leveling laser. Um, these won't be MR safe uh, typically, so you've got to be careful where you have them within your MR environment or where your, um, it depends on where the door is onto your, into your scanner room, depends on line of sights, things like that. Or you can go back to basics and use a, a water level, um, which is actually what we did with our scanner um, a couple of years ago during, during COVID. Um, benefits being that you can measure over a, a greater distance and it's also gonna be um, MR safe. Just remember, though, if you do use that, remember to put a, a little surfactant into your uh, liquid so that you minimize your meniscus errors. Um, we also want to know uh, for our laser systems where it is in space relative to our imaging plane and whether the plane that it's uh, projecting is parallel to the imaging plane. So you need a phantom for this. This is a, an example for the phantom that we have, which was actually provided with the external laser bridge by LAP. Um, but basically all you need is a phantom that um, has some external reference marks and internally has some corresponding um, markers that will show up on your MR scan. So some kind of fluid filled lines that allow you to check where your laser position is in space and you can then, uh, you could potentially move this around to check the plane, um, how parallel that is to your imaging plane. So those are the, the, the basic um, checks that we need to do in terms of our checking our couch, our lasers, um, and the requirements for those for, for radiotherapy. Um, so I just say thank you, and I'll pass over now back to Maria. Okay. I'm still having difficulty to move the I, I slide forward. No. Not working, Maria? No. Um, just try one more time. Hey. Yeah, okay. It's okay now. Okay, this part uh, is about the MR examinations in themselves. So I'll talk about some additional checks that we have to do. I'll talk about image quality, geometric accuracy, and the use of diagnostic MR examinations. The first thing we suggest in our report is to check the headers of uh, our images. We have a table in the report uh, with a number of fields that are relevant. And it's it uh, this, this suggestion is here because that's the only way to detect an operator error. An operator error could be, for example, the distortion correction not being applied, or perhaps uh, the wrong sequence being chosen. Uh, I would like to highlight to, um, to MRI personnel that we are used to see all this annotation in, in our image, in, in packs, in, in the workstations, but in radiotherapy, they don't have access 
to as much information as we do directly. They still have access to the DICON headers, of course, if they want to look, look it up. But because they have many, um, many data sets loaded at the same time, they usually recognize those data sets with a single uh, string like this one here, it's a generic label. To radiotherapy personnel, I must uh, highlight that those labels are absolutely generic. They do not mean anything. The, the number of the series uh, is irrelevant. If for any reason uh, a localizer is repeated, for example, the series are renumbered. And generic labels like T1, TSC, uh, there might be dozens of sequence sequences in a scanner with the same label. Even if we pick up a very specific label for radiotherapy, let's say radiotherapy brain for stereotactic radiotherapy, uh, it doesn't stop the MRI operator for, from making a change. What we are trying to do uh, with this header check is to prevent some errors. So this is an example of a, a specific case that happened at the Marsden where the patient had an MRI and the uh, radiotherapy personnel were unable to register it to the CT. The skull seemed uh, elongated. This patient ended up being rescanned, and on the second attempt, this was absolutely fine. So what we have here is the first attempt and the second attempt being registered in the scanner, and the discrepancy is huge. It took us a very long time to find out what was what was wrong, and it's simply being the wrong sequence being applied. What this patient, this examination uh, was undertaken with a sequence that was very sensitive to fielding homogeneity, a sequence with a low bandwidth, and is essentially an imaging sequence for diagnostic purposes. For diagnostic purposes, this examination is absolutely fine. Uh, what happened in here can only be, be detected by looking at the header. It's possible that some uh, dental work might have caused uh, a very poor shimming, but it's impossible to find out afterwards. The, the next thing we, we, we recommend in the report is to, to have constant checks for every patient with a communication alarm because of the additional needs of the patient positioning and checking the magnet ball for foreign objects. In terms of image quality, the, 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 the needs of radiotherapy are not really different from the needs of diagnostic imaging. They still require a contrast resolution and image quality SNR. So our uh, recommendations follow in three different groups. We recommend uh, a daily QA that is provided by the manufacturer. This is usually done very quickly in about five minutes with the head coil and a very basic test object. This uh, test is there to detect some major failures. It will, uh, will look at SNR and uniformity over a, a central area, and we will also detect uh, an unexpected change in power or in frequency that will be reported to the user. This is uncontroversial, most people will do that. Checking the receiver coils is the second group. And the reason for that is that they are the most common failure in MRI. We spent a lot of time uh, chasing element failures in receiver coils and sometimes failure of preamplifiers and amplifiers uh, throughout the receiver chain. So this is, it is actually quite important. And on top of that, there are image quality tests that are normally summarized, for example, with the ACR test object. But there are other test objects and what is required is basically a batch of tests of SNR uniformity, uh, slice thickness, contrast, and so on. The, the difficulty for us in here is to propose a frequency. There is a difference in culture between radiotherapy and MRI. Uh, radiotherapy expects very strict regimes because they are working with ionizing radiation. Uh, radiotherapy equipment that has not been QA'd cannot be used. 
In MRI, we often use equipment that has not been QA'd, and the only consequence of that is a poor examination that perhaps will have to be repeated. Because of that, we tend to be perhaps too relaxed. So when we proposed a frequency, we, we proposed a, a minimum frequency uh, that would be considered acceptable. And we put here a uh, annual frequency for those tests and perhaps quarterly for the receiver coil checks. Our American counterparts were uh, more ambitious than us and they, pro uh, they suggested much higher frequencies. They have a system of accreditation in there. We, the reason this seems to be so ambitious is that in order to check all the receiver coils in a given scanner, we need about half a day. And this may, may be seen as uh, an ex excessive amount of time due to the pressure and the waiting lists and the number of patients that we have to see in, in radiology, in diagnostic imaging. From the point of view of geometric accuracy, we have to be more careful in MR for radiotherapy, and we have to characterize the hardware-related geometric, geometric distortion that is essentially associated with our gradient coils and their design. And we have to uh, characterize and document the sensitivity to feeding, homo feeding homogeneity. We, we have a fundamental problem that every patient that goes into the scanner will modify the field of the scanner and will cause some feeding homogeneity. In addition, we have to look at radiotherapy accessories and how they might um, disturb both B0 and B1 transmit field. The, again, the recommendations of the APM are for tests at much higher frequencies that we were able to recommend. We recommended starting monthly with the gradient related geometric distortion and then uh, slow down to annual testing. I'll come back to discuss that uh, in a minute. So the recommendation of the IPM is essentially to use a large structured, structured test object to cover the entire clinically relevant volume. It's a little bit different from uh, an acceptance test, a standard acceptance test, because the spec is provided for a central portion of the magnet. And what we are suggesting that people characterize the entire pore. We suggest using a conventional 3D pulse sequence, uh, for example, 3D T1 spin echo, and to use very high uh, readout gradients to minimize susceptibility-related distortion. So the basic idea here is to characterize the gradient-related distortion. So our measurement should not be affected by any field homogeneity associated with our test object, for example. We are characterizing the gradients only. We also recommend acquiring data with and without the manufacturer's distortion correction applied. If we go without the distortion correction, we are characterizing the hardware. If we go with, we are characterizing a combination of hardware plus software. And in principle, it's possible that the software could change, for example. That's an example of our test object that gets pushed to the left and to the right so that we can look at the, at the entire ball. Those are commonly used test objects. If we purchase a test object to do a geometric distortion assessment, they tend to be large and heavy with the possible uh, exception of the modus that only characterizes the, the surface of the cylinder and calculates the displacement within. A number of people work with home-built test objects as well, and that's quite possible to do that. Okay, if we, if we purchase a, a test object for assessment of geometric distortion, we get out of the, the commercial products, test objects that are very accurately built and designed to minimize any magnetic susceptibility effects. They often include software for automated assessment, and that is 
very convenient. It makes perfect sense for a system dedicated to radiotherapy. Somebody who does not have a system dedicated to, to radiotherapy may feel that this is probably too large an expense, and perhaps it's quite possible to work either by borrowing a test object from somebody occasionally or by building something else. If the test object is home built, then we have to use a CT as a reference for measurements on displacement. And you can make either direct measurements, for example, in a radiotherapy uh, treatment planning system, or use a deformable registration and then look at the registration parameters. Uh, a number of people use home built test objects because they are quite convenient. Some of them are very light. This is an example of what we get uh, with the test objects at the Mars. And this one is built of sets of rods at three orthogonal directions. Those are three projections where all the lines appear straight and that's a 3D rendered view. That's the same sort of test object, although it's a different one. And I'm looking now at the central portion of the magneting here, just to show you that the distortion correction is required even if we are just considering a head volume. It is, it's already distorted. We do need the, the software correction. So if we are going to do um, look at to gradient related distortion, what we are suggesting is at least yearly measurements. And in those measurements, we should uh, document and identify regions where the displacements are under a millimeter and under two millimeters. The way to do that is to, um, one way to do that is to make this data set available in a radiotherapy planning system. For example, uh, this, this is a, a data set from the Marsden that people that have been registered by an expert uh, radiotherapy physicist and can be consulted so that people can see what kind of displacement we find over a head volume or over a, or a body volume. And we can see uh, what kind of standard can be, can be reached. It's a bit pointless to request to MRI that we should have a discrepancy of just one millimeter at the outer edges of the field of view. We cannot do that. This is the ultimate limit of what we can achieve in a given system. And we recommend as an action level to follow those data sets and investigate further if the displacement uh, changes by over two millimeters. So we are expecting here uh, an absolute stable measurement. Two millimeters may seem excessive, but it's practically impossible that a control point will suddenly jump by two millimeters. The, the, the distortion pattern is global. If I ever was to measure two millimeters of discrepancy, you would be at the outer edges of the, the test object. And if that happens, the center of the test object would still have a, a much uh, smaller discrepancy. I think we, we, we have to, to discuss that a little bit because it may seem surprising to make those measurements so so rarely. So the first interesting thing is that the gradient related distortion is basically a function of our gradient set. It does not depend on the pulse sequences. We, we simply pick up a good pulse sequence that minimizes susceptibility effects. What it depends on, the distortion pattern depends on the design of the gradient coils and the current applied. The current applied is very well controlled in a MR scanner because this um, relationship between the gradient amplitude and position is basically the core of the imaging system. So we don't really expect any changes here. 
and we don't expect any deformations of a gradient coil either. This is, I believe this is a, a picture of a reasonably modern uh, gradient. 15 minutes. I think somebody needs to, to mute here. Okay, thanks. What I was trying to say is that this, there isn't a lot of uh, scope for a distortion of uh, a deformation of a gradient coil. They are built in layers, they are covered in epoxy to uh, prevent it from, prevent it from making too much noise and vibration. So we don't really expect the, the, the gradient coils to change. I seem to have lost control, uh, Jim. Um, I think you should still have it, Maria. Do I? Yeah, I think so. There's nothing happening here. No. Um, let's try it again. Okay. So it, it, it's telling me that you do have control. <laughs> okay, that, that's fine. If I don't, if I don't manage to to move, I'll, I'll do something else. Um, I'll ask you to move the slides, and that, that'll be fine. So what I was trying to say is basically show what a gradient coil uh, looks like and the care that is taken for it not to vibrate. The next slide, please. I also find it important to uh, discuss uh, a little bit the, the frequency of those measurements. I think most people would agree that when we are working with uh, CTMR fusion, we still have another step afterwards. And if there is something, if there is a major distortion in our data set, this data set comes back to us for further queries. It's different if we have MR-only radiotherapy planning, and he's riskier still if we are using an mr linac So the frequency of QA has to increase here, and it actually does. An mr linac has uh, routines to work with daily QA. In MR-only radiotherapy planning, we would have to have the same care as we have with a CT uh, data set, and the CT is checked for geometry monthly, so we would have to do the same. And it's quite reasonable to check less frequently when we work with CTMR fusion. When we made our recommendation for the frequency of tests, we are taking into account that there are training needs and it's almost impossible to maintain a workforce that is trained to undertake a test if we don't do it at least once a year. It's also very important that people build up their own data sets to see how stable the distortion pattern is. Another issue is that a very high frequency of test, testing is sometimes used for reassuring the users that no distortion is actually happening. But the reality is that the users should not have been reassured by that. I showed earlier on a case where there was a massive distortion and that distortion would not have been picked up with a check on the gradient coils. If I had used that sequence on my test object, I'm very likely to get to have got very good results. That's because our test objects are very symmetrical and very easy to shim, and our subjects are not. So our next topic here, can I move to the next slide, please? Uh, is the susceptibility related distortion that is associated with our subjects. We have three gradients. The phase encoding is not an issue. The license lab selection is usually high enough and the readout gradient is the one we have control over. And we do want it to be high enough to make the susceptibility effects ne negligible. Our worst case scenario yeah, a worst case scenario is a situation like that where we have some metallic implants. And I could be asking myself, how do I know that the spine of this patient is not slightly shifted in the direction of the gradient, which is left to right in this particular case? 
it's very difficult to ascertain that. What we have to do is to minimize the probability of a problem like that ever happening. So what we do to minimize susceptibility related distortion is to start with good images by uh, always applying the distortion correction software and always working with 3D sequences if at all possible. We tend to use spin echoes over gradient echoes to minimize signal loss. And we have to pick up a receiver bandwidth that is high enough. So what I have here in this, uh, in this picture is a test object that has got a chemical shift that is oil on the outside and water on the inside and an air bubble on the top of the object. And as we increase the readout gradient, the geometric accuracy gets better and better. And we can tell from those images that after a certain level, the displacements came, became smaller than a pixel. There is no point in increasing the readout gradient any further. We are just making the images noisier. So in order to know where to stop, I need to have an idea of what is the field homogeneity that I'm going to find. So, what the IPM recommends is to document the process. So for each workflow, document the maximum displacement that can be tolerated. And document a volume of interest to include the tumor organs at risk and any structure needed for registration. So that's an example of an acoustic neuroma radiotherapy planning. This will be used by the operator of the scanner that was um, discussed last week. The operator will make sure that the field of view is adequate. We'll make sure that the shim box is relevant and no uh, additional uh, sources of inhomogeneity are introduction, introduced. And the operator will ensure that the volume of interest is placed at the center of the magnet or as close to the center of the magnet as possible. But prior to that, a clinical scientist has to set up the sequences. And the se clinical scientist in MRI will document the level of fielding homogeneity that is expected. There are many ways of doing that. One way, a uh, very accurate way of doing that would be to map the fielding homogeneity over a group of patients. That's what we did in a paper, but in most cases that is not really necessary. We can consult the literature, and in most cases, it's reasonable to use the fat water shift as an estimate. It's not reasonable to do that in the presence of metallic implants, for example. But in most cases, uh, this is a reasonable assumption, and we have to record that assumption. And then we document the expected displacement in the proposed sequence, and that has to be fed back to radiotherapy. What we have proposed, we, we have a table here to in, in the in the report to help people to, to do that. What we are trying to do is to encourage a multidisciplinary approach where radiotherapy tell MRI what is the volume of interest and what is the displacement that can be tolerated. And MRI estimates the fielding homogeneity and the displacement. And those numbers have to tie. And then we end up with an examination that meets the requirement of the users. Uh, because there is a lot of uh, radiotherapy personnel, I would like to highlight here as well that we can do very, we can get very robust post sequences. That's an example of the three uh, worst offenders in terms of foreign bodies find, found in MRI commonly found in MRI scanners. I found that the worst offender is the hairpin. And I did uh, an experiment where I placed the hairpin inside the magnet. I'm suggesting you do not try this at home because the last thing you want to do is to lose a foreign body inside your, your couch. This was done with a great deal of care. The hairpin is inside a container and taped up so that it won't cause any harm. We have images without the hairpin. We put the hairpin and allow the system to reshim and achieve the best field homogeneity that it can. And that is the difference. While all of that is happening, 
the field in homogeneity reaches about three parts per million, there is no chance fat suppression will work for this subject. But, but the accuracy is preserved. It can be done. That's what I'm trying to say. It can be done. And my final topic is the use of diagnostic MR in radiotherapy planning. We do not recommend it with the possible exception of uh, cranial radiotherapy because there are um, many protocols with high bandwidth being commonly used and the, the images often achieve, the 3D images often achieve uh, good quality for radiotherapy. So we propose a set of parameters that have to be checked and we propose uh, additional care in the registration. We also refer in our report to end-to-end -end QA uh, with workflow uh, applied to the, to the test object in MR and CT. And uh, the advantage of using those systems is that all aspects of the MR CT fusion are QA'd. However, this may not re uh, reproduce a clinical situation. At this point, I would like to pass it, pass it over to Ben. Okay. Sorry, Ben, I think I want it on an extra slide there. Do you want to introduce yeah. yourself, Ben, before you start? Will do. Um, my name is Ben, and I'm uh, the lead ML Linux physicist um, at Genesis Care, based in Oxford. Um, and uh, this section is about quality assurance for the MRCT image registration process. And so, um, sort of overall aims and scope of this section were to, for us to give some clinical examples of image re registration and to discuss sort of some practical elements of how to commission and QA that process. Um, we have a recommendation that centers follow uh, the principles from AAPM TG 132. Um, and sort of give, again, as I say, some practical advice on, on how you can be compliant with those recommendations. And um, we recommend rigid image registration as used in clinical practice. Um, and the, the key messages for us in this section um, are that, that CT to MR, sorry, MR to CT image registration really is a significant component in that whole workflow um, to really take, um, to sort of make the most of those images. Um, and it's really important um, in bringing that benefit of MRI to radiotherapy. Um, the MRI to CT registration method used for each site should be documented, and we recommend that this is done in um, clinical protocols. Um, there should be a QA program um, to undertaken to characterize the ac accuracy of different registration techniques used, and um, that there should be clear communication of the registration success and what clinical utility there is. And this should follow a standardized format. Um, so there's some really good literature in this area. I'm not going to, um, um, that we obviously can't include um, all the details in, in our report, but if anyone wants to sort of um, get a deeper understanding or, or some further background onto this, um, there's obviously the AAPM um, TG152 report, and there's some other things as well. Um, so I definitely recommend these for some for some more theory and a bit more in depth in some of these topics. There are four steps here to the image image registration process. The uh, first is to import the MRI and CT data sets into your software. Secondly, to perform an initial manual registration, and then moving on to define an ROI based on the anatomy so we can, um, put, um, if required, to hone our registration to the area of interest. And finally, to perform um, an automatic registration using the software, either globally or using that ROI that we've just defined. Um, so just some points to sort of think about for each of those steps. In terms of importing MRI and CT data sets, um, there can be differences in um, how software treats this, but broadly speaking, Registration software will assume that MR images acquired in the same session or in the same position. The benefit there is that there's only the requirement to perform a single registration if the mobilization is good. However, um, if the patient um, 
move between different acquisitions, then there's a requirement to register all those um, different sequences separately. And how to do this, you need to figure out how to do this and how to determine the process of doing this during the commissioning of your um, MRI to CT registration process. Um, and look at how to create those separate transformations and document the process that you need to go through. And it may be that some workarounds are required to sort of unlink the MR images so they can each be registered individually. The next step is to perform that initial manual reg registration. And this is just to act as a seed point to align the MRI and the CT ops, um, sort of focus on the, um, the region that we're gonna use for contouring. So when looking to define an ROI to guide the registration, this should um, be an ROI that encapsulates the anatomy of interest and we need to consider patient mobilization and uh, any anatomical differences between the MRI and CT images. And finally, to perform a global um, or local automatic uh, rigid image registration. And a key point here is sort of depending on the stopping criteria for the automatic match, it may be possible to improve the registration um, by repeating the, um, that step if the maximum iteration is, is, uh, is reached. Um, and just some clinical examples for three different sites of sort of how to define or how we recommend defining that guiding ROI and some key points to consider. So in the brain, um, it's key to ensure that um, both the MRI and CT uh, are taking a suitable time post-surgery if, if that's relevant to allow um, any swelling to reduce. And we recommend that limiting the guiding ROI just the cranium and excluding the mandible and neck where there's more likely to be potential movements that can reduce that registration quality. So in the image on the right here, the yellow box is the um, guiding ROI that we're recommending. In the abdomen and the thorax, um, if the image is acquiring in breath hold with good immobilization, then a global rigid registration is recommended. However, just due to the de deformable nature of the soft tissues, that can cause differences where that, um, that require a guiding ROI, and that should be limited to just the organ of interest. So in that example there, that guiding ROI is just limited to the liver to focus our registration there, because potentially of um, some changes in anatomy elsewhere that, that, um, that were um, reducing the quality of the match for a global um, rigid registration. And if there are any deviations from the protocol, for example, like using that guiding ROI or the regions that have been compromised by using it, they should be documented on a per patient basis. Um, and uh, I'll come to that again in a second. And finally, um, example here in the pelvis, um, the soft tissue changes in the bladder and rectum are fairly common. And we recommend that a local registration um, with a guiding ROI is optimized for the anatomy of interest. Uh, a two-step process here, firstly, including the bony anatomy, so the, the larger blue box, um, and then narrowing that down to just the tissue of interest, so in the yellow box there. However, in cases where the anatomy of interest is very close to the bone, then just the bone-based rigid registration um, is, could be a good soft surrogate for that soft tissue. So in terms of commissioning in the per patient QA required, um, in AAPM they refer to validation, we would call that commissioning. Um, and here the aim is to evaluate the entire workflow to characterize how the software, the algorithms and the data transfer handle patient data. Um, we can use phantoms, both physical and digital, to provide a ground truth for assessment. And this should be performed when setting up a new service or there's significant changes to software or hardware. And then on a per patient um, basis, there's individual patient verification. And the aim here is to ensure that the accuracy of the specific registration uh, that's been used um, for, for a given patient is acceptable for that, for that intended use. And we have qualitative assessments here because there's no known or expected result to compare against. Um, so I've taken this table on the left here from our document. I'm not going to talk about every test in detail, but um, we recommend a, a sort of suite of tests for the commissioning and um, um, commissioning process. Um, uh, th these tests are all discussed in our document, and there's um, 
sort of further discussion and, and, and um, of them in various literature. So for example, in the AAPM report, um, uh, recommend, uh, has a good discussion of all these tests as well. And in terms of per patient verification, there's a, a qualitative assessment here that we um, recommend by two independent people. So that would be the operator of the, um, of the software who's producing the registration and the end user. And they can use various tools that are included with most uh, registration software. So a split screen or a checkerboard, the image overlay, contour mapping and, and difference images to determine um, the quality of that assessment. So um, in terms of request and um, report documentation, so we recommend that um, there's documentation which communicates what is expected from the registration required. And that can start, can comprises of, of two components, a request from the oncologist that there is a registration between an MRI and a CT, and then a report from the operator on the quality of, of that assessment. And these should form part of the patient's treatment record. For that request, we're, we're not suggesting here that every single individual request has its own sort of um, uh, individual registration has its own request, but that process should be included in the documented in the clinical protocols. So it's sort of part of the patient's treatment anyway. Um, that request and in that protocol, it should sort of discuss the structures that are going to be contoured on the MRI so that we can identify the region of interest to focus on for the image regist registration. Should discuss the method to be used, including which software it is and any specific options that have been decided as part of that commissioning process to use. And also the accuracy required um, to be to be uh, accuracy required based on agreed uh, agreed descriptors, which will come into a sec, um, including details of any areas where a local transformation is acceptable rather than, rather than um, a global registration. And the second documentation is a report um, from the operator undertaking the image registration. Um, this will likely not be the end user, so the accuracy of the registration should be reported in an ambiguous manner. Any deviations from the clinical protocol should be documented, and we recommend using some uh, descriptors described by AAPM, which I'll come to in one second, and highlight any areas where the registration is too poor to be used clinically, and that may include annotating images if appropriate. Um, so finally, this is uh, a table which is not in our document. It's taken from AAPM 132, but we recommend that it is used, which has a sort of um, standardized descriptors for the quality of uh, registration um, with sort of five levels there, zero, where the whole scan is perfectly aligned and useful, and the whole um, image can be used for structured de definition and perhaps um, appropriate in high dose uh, set saber localization as well down to an assessment of four, where there's um, no alignment is acceptable and um, um, it's not it, um, it's una unable to align the anatomy to acceptable levels, um, potentially because the patient uh, position was too great between the scans. Um, and so um, using these terms as part of that documentation process will ensure that everyone is sort of clearly communicating unambiguously the, um, the accuracy of the registration. Um, so I'd just like to thank, on behalf of the, the three of us presenting, um, acknowledge the, the entire working group. There's a selection of us there from one of our meetings up in um, up at Ivan HQ, post-work beers. And um, with that, I think we'll take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Can I just pass on my thanks to yourself and to Steve and to Maria for a really interesting set of talks there. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of the questions, um, we've had one question in the chat, um, which Steve has responded to. I'll just read it out so that people can um, hear it if they haven't seen it, um, which was about safe um, spirit levels for um, MRI um, and the sort of a lack of available um, MR safe spirit levels. Um, Steve, do you want to comment on your uh, response there? Um, yeah, so I think uh, as Cameron was just asking about um, what any any MR safe um, spirit levels where the the offset or the how uh, you know the, the lines on the spirit level what what that corresponds to in terms of a level. 
um, he was asking if he had any rec we had any recommendations for spirit levels where that is defined. Um, I would say, from my own personal experience, don't have a specific recommendation. Um, we have used them in the past, although we've either done a subjective assessment of is it central or not. Um, um, but there was also used self-leveling lasers with our scanner and um, the water lines, as as this described in the in the presentation. But um, that might not work for every center. I realize that um, uh, we also have a mechanical workshop near us. We could uh, quantify or determine what that angle offset is locally as well. It depends on what, what you've got available to you, I guess. Well, thank you. Um, and are there any other questions from the, uh, the audience today? I had one quick question, or probably <laughs> quick or long, depending. Um, it was for you, Maria. You mentioned um, that you often use um, non-QA equipment for, for MRI, and, uh, and you sort of mentioned there could be no consequences for radiotherapy of doing so. And I, I thought, I don't know if that's always true. Do you think there are consequences of using non-QA equipment at times? Uh, I think there are, but I, I have to acknowledge a different culture uh, in MR mm. and in radiotherapy uh, because we are not using ionizing radiation. Mm. Uh, we are more relaxed, and I think that's a reality. We find very difficult to fight for scanner time to do uh, the work that we have to do. And our work is not only QA. I think we spend more time trying to sort out protocols that fail for a number of different reasons, uh, artifacts, motion. And some protocols are, are very, very difficult. And the, the QA sometimes is, is pushed to the side uh, by fault finding. Sometimes you, you have to deal with an error and then that takes priority. So even when we, we, we schedule the QA, sometimes it gets pushed to the side. And I'm, I'm not alone on that. This is the reality of MRI. We, the QA doesn't have the same status. That's the so radiotherapy you, QA. Do you not, I mean, total ignorance, I suppose, but you, I suppose you don't often make a change to um, any part of the scanner on the basis of QA, that's not a frequent thing that would happen. It does happen, actually. It does happen. We we detect problems when we do QA. In fact, that that's uh, that's an area of, of uh, great discussion because uh, some of our coils have really many elements now of the order of thirty different elements, and if one of them fails, it's very difficult to see that in a clinical image, it's, it's almost invisible. If you don't QA the coil, you don't see that in a particular part of the image, the SNR is lower. The SNR is often position dependent now and depends on how the coils are combined. So it, it's it's actually quite involved. And uh, it, th there is an obvious benefit in doing that. It's, it's very often that we find that there is a, a fault in a coil and it hasn't been noticed. Yeah, sounds like a really long discussion. I want to ask more questions, but I'm not going to. I'll just pass it back one more time to the audience. If anyone has anything um, they'd like to add, would you like to um, jump in? Um, otherwise, we are bang on time to finish at half past one. So I'll give you 20 seconds just to say anything you want to anybody. Deafening silence. Well, thank you so much again to our speakers today. Um, really appreciate it. And we will uh, close the webinar there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.